or name Jesus. Amen. Uh, take your copy of God's Word, take your Bibles, and open them up to Ephesians chapter 3, specifically verses 14 through 21. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. At least twice a year, we take time together on a Sunday morning to pray as a church, to examine a portion of God's Word and then to allow that part of Scripture to lead us to pray and to pray well together. Prayer matters. That seems like a statement I shouldn't have to make in church, but sometimes it's good to remember that prayer matters. Martin Luther, the great reformer, in a sermon on prayer once said, no one can no one can believe how powerful prayer is and what it can affect except those who have learned it by experience. I know whenever I have prayed earnestly that I have been heard and have obtained more than I prayed for. God sometimes delays, but He always comes. When we gather to pray together as a church, we do so in faith with dependence and trust in Christ, having confidence that God hears us and having confidence that He will answer our prayers uh, uh, either with what we ask for or with something that even better fits His glorious purposes for us. As I consider and pray about us as a church, and I do so often, even as I evaluate what we're doing and where God is leading us, uh, I presently find myself longing for a greater sense of God's strength and leadership among us as a church. I'm not a particularly charismatic pastor, nor am I an especially gifted manager of people or processes, nor am I the most creative person among us. My power and my leadership are full of holes and human weaknesses. And by the way, so is the leadership of every pastor in every church. And friends, so is the membership of every church. We do well to remember that it's by God's strength and for God's glory that we do all that we do. And it's good for us to pray in ways that remind us of this. So this is my intention for us today, that we take this Sunday as a part of our worship in God's Word to pray for God to strengthen His church according to His Word. And for our help to do this well, we Turn to Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21, a prayer uh, from the Apostle Paul for the church in Ephesus that he took time to write down that they might read and know his heart and his prayer for them. I invite you to stand with me to honor God as we read his word. Ephesians 3, <clears throat> excuse me, 14 through, verses 14 through 21, there the Apostle Paul and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writing to the church at Ephesus says, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He might grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is God's word. You may be seated. During these times of uh, prayer services, of prayer, uh, if you've been here for uh, a couple of years or so, you're probably into the rhythm of it a little bit. Uh, I'll just give you a preview of what we're going to do uh, during this time. Uh, We're going to take some uh, moments to work through the text that we've just read to understand it, and then uh, then I'm going to do my best to uh, help us know how that Uh, passage, how these verses of Scripture should shape our praying specifically uh, for the church and for God's work among us. When we move into that time of uh, of praying, I'd invite you to um, maybe get together with some people that are around you, friends, family members, other church members. Um, If you want to move your seats a little bit to uh, be a little more comfortable in circles as we pray, we'll have kind of three portions of of prayer this morning, times of prayer together this morning. You can move your chairs, that's great. Just do me a favor and move them back when you're done, okay? Uh, Save, it'll save my back this afternoon. Uh, I want to begin by 
just pointing out some initial or making some initial observations about the passage that we've just read here in Ephesians. There are a few things to note about this prayer that Paul records for the church in Ephesus uh, before we allow it to guide and shape our praying together this morning. First, we have to ask from verse 14, what is the reason that Paul is praying this way? You notice there in verse 14, he says, for this reason, I bow before the Father. Well, Paul, for what reason? To find the reason for this prayer, we actually have to go back to the end of, all the way back to the end of chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, where we read this. Paul says, for through him, through Christ, we both have access, that both is Jew and Gentile. In Christ, we both, Jew and Gentile, have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus. Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now it's interesting, chapter 3, verse 1, has Paul writing, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, and then he gets distracted for the next 13 verses and writes about something else. And then he comes back to, in verse 14, that reason, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Why is Paul praying this way for the church? Well, based on chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, it's specifically for this reason, that by Christ's work on the cross, dying for sins, he has opened the way for Jews and Gentiles, people of all nationalities and ethnicities, both together to become members of the household of God, growing together in a living and holy temple of God. By the hope of the gospel, the good news of Christ's death for sins, resurrection from the dead, his ascension to heaven, believers of all ethnicities are made to be a dwelling place for God by his Holy Spirit. For this reason, because of this, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father. That's really something. This is the effect of the gospel. This is part of what the gospel does among the body of Christ, that Christ's death not only accomplishes our forgiveness of sin and reconciliation to God when we call out to Christ for rescue, but that the rescue Jesus provides when we trust him destroys all those petty and sinful reasons that keep us separated from one another. As the Spirit of God dwells in the hearts of believers by their faith in Christ. God's Spirit makes them one. He brings them together in one body. There is one Spirit for male believers and the same Spirit for female believers. There is one Holy Spirit that lives in black and brown-skinned believers and the same Holy Spirit that lives in white-skinned believers. There is one Spirit of God who makes His home in the hearts of believers who grew up Jewish and the same Spirit of God in the hearts of those who grew up anything and everything else. When our trust is placed in Christ alone, the one Holy Spirit of God makes His dwelling, His home, in all of our hearts just the same. And it's this recognition of this amazing reality that drives Paul to his knees to pray for the strength of the church in Ephesus. Because there's one Spirit in all of us, so I pray that God would strengthen His church. Second, I would encourage you to notice the posture of Paul's prayer. For this reason, he says... I bow my knees before the Father. Paul's posture in prayer is kneeling. That may not be a big deal to you, but the normal posture for prayer for Jews uh, uh, when they pray is to stand, not to kneel, but to stand. But kneeling is a posture of humility, of obedience, of submission in every way to the one being bowed before. Paul, in prayer, gives his whole self internally in the in the posture of his heart, and externally, in the posture of his body. He gives all of himself in submission to God, who saves through Christ and sends his Spirit. Third, we do all to observe that Paul's prayer is all about what he wants God to do in the people who are his church. It's a prayer that God would work in their hearts, in the inner person, the inner man, to make them into the people uh, that God would have them to be, filled up, with Christ, rooted in the lived experience of Christ's love, mature in godliness. He doesn't pray about what the church will do. He prays for what the church will be and what they will become by God's power. So then how should we pray according to Ephesians 3 today? I have, I have three uh, exhortations for us. First, as a church, we ought to pray for God to renew and strengthen our souls. Well, we see this from verses 14 through the first part of 17. 
Paul's primary request in this prayer. The thing he asks God for first is that God would strengthen the church by His power through the Holy Spirit in their inner being, in their inner man. Now, I don't know a a believer who doesn't want a strong church, who doesn't want to be a part of a healthy, vibrant church. But the question is, how does a church become strong? How does a church become healthy, become vibrant? Who is it that strengthens the church, according to Paul's prayer? Is it a pastor? Is it a charismatic leader? No, it's God. Who, how is it that God strengthens the church? Is it by the teaching ministry of Sunday school leaders? No, He strengthens the church by His Spirit. What is the supply of God's strengthening? Is it all the great curriculum and education and, and financial resources that the church gives? Is that, how, is that the supply of God's strengthening for the body? No, it's the riches of His glory. Where are, the, where are the church strengthened? Are they strengthened in their programs? Are they strengthened in their, their community presence? Are they strengthened in their reputation in the city that they're in or the, the denomination that they're a part of? No, their strengthening comes in their inner being, their soul, the very seat of who they are, their heart. The result that Paul seeks for the church that is strengthened is Paul asks God to strengthen his church. The result is there for us in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that God would strengthen you by his spirit so that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. This is a prayer that reminds us ultimately of the gospel, friends, of what it means that Christ dwells in us and how it is that he comes to dwell in us. All the way in the earliest, the first chapter of Ephesians, as Paul is recounting the glory of the gospel for the church in Ephesus, he writes in Ephesians 1, 11 to 14, in him, in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who's the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Here's how Christ comes to dwell in you, friend. And it's, this is not a given for everyone. It's not an automatic thing for everybody. Christ does not dwell in the hearts of all people by default. These verses have clearly stated that Christ comes to live in us by His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, as Romans 8 and 1 Peter 1 and Philippians 1 all remind us. And the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell in those who have hoped in Christ, who have placed their confidence in Jesus, who have placed their expectation for rescue from sin and a right relationship with God on the basis of the person and work of Jesus. Plainly put, when they put their faith in Him, when they believe Him. Understand this morning that Paul is praying that the church would be strengthened by God through the power of His Spirit, renewed by the Spirit, so that at their very core of who they are, they would be people that are shaped by Jesus, who is Himself the power of the gospel message. In a moment, I want to ask you to maybe gather in small groups. You can pray by yourself. That's fine. I invite you to stand, sit, kneel, however is appropriate for you in your posture of praying. And I invite you to pray a number of different ways. I invite you to pray that God would help you to see that spiritual strength and renewal only comes from Him. Not by our power, not by our strength, not by our gifts, but only from God. Friend, this morning, if you're not yet a Christian, you've not yet trusted Christ for salvation, repenting of your sin and depending on his death at the cross for your forgiveness, his resurrection from the dead for the promise of eternal life, I'd invite you to ask God to open your heart to the promise of salvation in Jesus. Ask God to save you by his grace through faith in Christ today. Church members, I invite you and ask that you'd pray for our church to be a people who are shaped by the Holy Spirit and who are confident in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The thing that Paul prays, the church would be strengthened by and and for. Let's take a minute, gather in in small groups, and let's take some time to pray this way together. You'll see those prompts on the screen if you need a reminder, but let's take a moment and pray together as a church for our church.
confess that if your house is to be built, that you must do the work. If we work apart from your strength, we labor and toil in vain. And for our own glory, which will all fade away in short time. So, Father, we pray you strengthen this church, its members, that you, by the power of your Spirit, cause Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith. We believe, each one that has trusted Christ, that he is dwelling in us. We ask, uh, God, that you would make us more sensitive to his presence and uh, more ready to obey and follow him. Strengthen your church, God, we pray in Jesus' name. Well, Ephesians 3 leads us to uh, pray that God would strengthen his church. As the passage continues, specifically the second part of verse 17 through verse 19, Paul uh, encourages us, or at least from Paul's prayer, we are encouraged to pray that we would grow up in godly maturity. One of the ways God strengthens his church, or one of the reasons for which God strengthens his church, is that so we would grow up in godly maturity. As this prayer of the apostle continues, we find uh, that his first prayer for strength results in faith by which Christ, through the Holy Spirit, lives in the church. We see all of God's persons involved here, don't we? The Father strengthening his church by the Spirit so that Christ dwells in their hearts through faith. And then in verses 17 through 19, we find that Christ, it's Christ in the hearts of the church that results in more strength. Look at verse 17. So Paul's already prayed for strength. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength. Strength for what? Well, strength to specifically know Christ's love. And there are two ways that Paul prays the church would know Christ's love. He wants them first to know it cognitively, to have an understanding of Christ's love in their brains. The prayer that is that the church would have a comprehension of the manner and degree and shape of Christ's love. Paul says, you may have, verse 18, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ. His prayer is that God will help them to measure the immeasurability of the love of Jesus. It's a love that's broader than the distance from east to west. It is longer than time itself, stretching from eternity past to eternity future. The love of Christ is higher than the heavens, and it's deeper than the place that you store your darkest secrets. There is no place, no time, no dimension that can limit the love of Jesus. Now, almost like the concept of infinity, we can't really measure love like that. But we can comprehend the mystery of its immeasurability. We can't measure it all, but we can know that it's immeasurable. That's one thing that Paul wants for the church to understand, that Christ's love cannot be fathomed, cannot be measured. It can't be uh, written down or put into a box in all of its entirety. He wants them to know God's love, know Christ's love cognitively. He also prays that they would know Christ's love experientially, personally. The second word that Paul uses to describe what what uh, we know or would know of Christ's love is often translated just as that four-letter English word, know, K-N-O-W. It comes to us in verse 19, and to know the love of Christ. But what that word in the Greek language in which Paul wrote means is not just to know in your brain, it's to know with all that you are as a person. It means to know by experience. It's one thing to know that Christ's love is unbound and unlimited and surpasses all knowledge. It's one thing to have some kind of comprehension of that. It's another thing altogether to know that Christ has loved you this way. And to know it not as a matter of fact, but as a matter of experience. To have been changed by Christ's love is to know his love this way. To have grappled with what Jesus provided for you at the cross and and to have received him as your substitute for sins is to know Christ's love this way. To see the distance which the Son of God crossed to be near to sinners and the friend of sinners and to rest your soul in him is to know Christ's love the way that Paul prays we would. That's what Paul wants for the church it's what he knows that they need God's help to know. This is not a thing that we can, we can come to experience on our own effort. But to know God's love experientially, relationally, intimately, personally, we have to have God's help to know it. That's why he asks for strength 
for us to know Christ's love this way. But even knowing Christ's love, cognitively and experientially, even knowing Christ's love is not the end of it all. It's not the final purpose of Paul's praying. For Paul prays that this would result in still more. Specifically, he prays that this uh, knowledge of the love of Christ would result in the church finding itself growing up in godly maturity. He says he prays this way so that they'll have strength to comprehend the immeasurability and to know personally the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge so that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the way that Paul prays for godly maturity, that they would be filled with all the fullness of God. And if you have your Bibles open, you can look forward a few verses uh, to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, where uh, there and in the, in the verses that precede it, Paul is reminding the church that they are to do the work of ministry under the leadership of those that God has given to lead them in a way that builds one another up in love. Chapter 4, verse 13 says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He prays in chapter 3 that they would be filled with all the fullness of God. He instructs them in chapter 4 to build one another up until they attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The same word in both places. What's the difference between being filled with the fullness of God and attaining the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? I would say there isn't a difference. But these are two ways of saying the same thing. Paul desires that the church, the believers that are gathered together in the name of Jesus and covenanted together in gospel work in the city of Ephesus, that they would know the love of Christ so that they might grow up in their faith, mature in their faith, that they would grow up in their knowledge of Christ and his word, that they would grow up and mature in the way that they serve the body of Christ, the church that they would grow up in the responsibility that they take for one another, that they would grow up and advance in their holiness, that they would grow up in their boldness to proclaim the gospel, that they would grow up in their patience and long-suffering with younger believers who haven't quite got things figured out just yet, and older believers who haven't quite figured out things just yet, that they would grow up in the way that they pray, that they would be filled with the fullness of God, that they would attain to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul's praying for their maturity as a body. So many things about our culture today are aimed at keeping us from growing up. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. That jingle was the soundtrack of every commercial break in between Power Rangers when I was in third and fourth grade. (laughs) But that sentiment of not wanting to grow up, uh, 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 of being a kid at heart forever, has infiltrated so much of our lives and our culture. Friends, it infiltrates the church too. We must not be children in the faith forever. We must grow up. We must mature. We must advance in our knowledge of Christ, both cognitively and experientially. experientially. We, we, We must fill out our 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 passion and zeal for proclaiming the gospel. We, we must not be content to only know the basics of what God has said in his word, but that we might know all of it and know all of it more and more as every day goes on, that, that we press one another further in maturity in Christ, in discipling relationships. Healthy things grow and mature. And if the church is not maturing in faith, not maturing in Christ-like character and qualities and ministry. It's because she has not known the love of Christ and because Christ is not dwelling in her by faith and because her inner being is not depending on the strength and presence of God. Do you see? All these things are stacked on top of one another. Paul prays that God would strengthen his church so that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith, so that they would know the incomprehensibility of Christ's love, and so that they would become mature, be filled with all the fullness of God. And if a church is not growing in maturity, it's because she's not known Christ's love the way that she ought to, because she's not depended upon God's uh, uh, strength in the church, because Christ is not dwelling in her heart through faith, because she is not depending on God to strengthen her by the power of his spirit. Do you see? 
All of these are stacked upon one another, dependent upon one another. So if there's a failure at any point in Paul's prayer, the intention is the other things won't be the case either. If we're not maturing as a church, it's because we've not known the love of Christ as a church. And because we have have not depended uh, upon the indwelling of Christ in us and upon God for his strength to grow us. This leads us to our second time to pray together as a church. Paul prays for the church's godly maturity. How then should we pray for our church's godly maturity in light of what we see in Scripture? One way, you can pray that we will know Christ personally and intimately. That's what Paul prays. It's good for us to always pray that. Pray that Jesus would make himself clear to you and demonstrate the immeasurability of his personal love for us. Ask God to show us we are, we are still immature in our faith, in our ministry as a church, in our dependence on Him, and pray for God's help to repent of sinful immaturity. Ask God to fill us up with His fullness. Ask God to grow us in godly maturity. Friend, you may have a way, uh, uh, an area in your life where you know you particularly need God's maturing uh, power and strengthening uh, to happen in your life. Pray that way. And be crazy enough to pray that out loud with other people that know and love you and ask them to, to, by God's help, to help you to grow as well. But as Paul prays for the maturity of the church, let us pray for the godly maturity of this church, of Christ's body and bride expressed here in this place. Let's pray. Father, as the voices of your saints continue to fill this room, praying for you to grow us up, so, uh, so we, we ask that, uh, Lord, if it's possible, you listen and answer even more intently. God, we know that, that that's not really a possibility necessarily, but, but I pray, God, that uh, you'd turn your ear to our prayers. Help us to pray rightly. Help us to pray for what is best. Uh, and God, as you answer, even as you may answer differently than we pray, help us to see, uh, help us to see your, your good and glorious purposes in answering the way you do. Uh, 
as the body of Christ, we must grow. And not growth for the sake of growth. Cancer grows for the sake of growth. We, God, we want to grow for health, strength, and vitality. And not for our own, but for the strength and vitality of the gospel message. Of the hope that Jesus Christ saves sinners. And we can't do that on our own, God. You must do it in us. We will grow up in maturity, Father, as we are reminded and think of and know the love of Christ displayed for us at Calvary and in his resurrection. We will grow in maturity. We know, Father, as, uh, as we depend on you to fill us to all of your fullness, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, but we must set that as our heart's desire. And so whatever impedes our maturity, God, whatever slows us from growing in Christ because the measure of the stature of His fullness is not our aim. God, get those things out of the way that we might see Christ clearly, love Him uh, deeply and passionately and strive after Him with every ounce of effort that You supply. Grow us up, Father, for our sake, yes, but for Yours too and for the sake of the ministry of the gospel among us, we ask in Christ's name. Well, we have prayed for God to strengthen us by His power through His Spirit. We've prayed that, uh, and I hope that we'll continue to pray that God will grow us in godly maturity and Christian maturity. Uh, But the last way we pray might be my favorite this morning. It comes to us from verses 20 and 21, that we... Pray above all for God to be glorified in this church. The final two verses of the passage, verses 20 and 21, often read like a benediction or a doxology uh, in church services. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. See how Paul closes his prayer for the church here. It's still a prayer to God, but it's for God who is overflowing, abounding in glory and power to make His church into what He desires them to be, to receive also something from His church, trusting that God will do in the church all that Paul has already prayed that he will fill and illumine and strengthen and mature the church. Paul now trusts that God will receive glory from the church and from Christ Jesus. Glory is a sometimes ambiguous concept. Glory is fame. It is majesty. Glory is an irrefutable reputation of magnificence. It is praise and worship. Glory is the magnification, multiplication, and reverberation of that which is beautiful and worthy and powerful and perfect. And Paul says that God might receive all glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. This is what Paul wants God to receive from his mature, Christ-loved, spirit-indwelt people that he has strengthened by his own power. Friends, It is a guarantee, even as Paul prays, that God is glorified in Christ. All of the life of Jesus and what He has done points to the praise of the Father. Jesus even says in John chapter 17, uh, uh, in His high priestly prayer, He says, Father, I have accomplished all that You sent Me to do. I have glorified Your name. The question is whether God is glorified in the church. Is God glorified at First Baptist West Albuquerque? He he most assuredly will be if Christ, who always glorifies God, is at the center of who we are. God will be glorified in us if Christ is at the center of who we are, corporately and individually. I hope you notice in all this that Paul does not expect God to be glorified primarily in what the church does. 
Though to be sure, we are to bring God glory in everything that we do. Paul also writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to the glory of God. We, we are meant to glorify God in all that we do. But here in Ephesians, Paul does not pray that, the church will be, that God will be glorified by what the church does. He prays that God will be glorified by what the church is. Oh, how often we pray that God will help us to do things so that He can get glory. How often we pray and, and, and ask Him to bless our plans so that, he will be, so that He will be praised. How often we plead with Him to give us strength to do so that He would be praised. And these are not wrong prayers, Christian, but they may be wrong-headed if we're not also praying for God to be glorified in who we are as those renewed by the power of God to believe in the Son of God, to be filled by the Spirit of God so that we might grow up into maturity by God. Is God glorified in who you are? Does your life display His irrefutable reputation of magnificence? Is God glorified in the very heart and soul, in the identity of our church family? Is His praise and worship is everything beautiful about God multiplied and magnified and reverberated by us in all that we are? Are we more than just Jesus-flavored religious busybodies? But in reality, are we a congregation of those who have been transformed by God's grace through dependent faith on Jesus? Oh, church, let us give glory to God with prayers of worship and requests that result in His praise. Let us pray that God would be glorified in who we are, not just in what we do. For if He is glorified in who we are first, certainly He will be glorified in what we do, but it's not always true the other way around. So how then shall we pray for God to be glorified in His church? We pray asking God to do things, to, to do abundantly among us what only He can do. He's able to do abundantly more than anything we could ask or think, Paul says. There are ways God intends to be glorified in His church that we don't even know how to ask because we don't even know how to think about it. But we could pray, God, be glorified in us in ways we don't even know how to pray. Offer prayers of praise to God for how you see Him maturing us, for how you see Him answering the prayers that we've already prayed this morning. Give God praise for that. It's His work in us accomplishing those things, not our own. Praise Him in your prayer. Ask God to show us His glory so that we might have more opportunity to praise Him. One of the most audacious prayers, requests of God, I think, in in all of Scripture comes to us in Exodus chapter 34, following the the great sin of worshiping the golden calf that the the Hebrews, under the leadership of Aaron, while Moses was was away, were, were guilty of. And Moses goes to intercede for the people to God, and he's standing there on the mountain with God, says, God, show me your glory. That's a bold prayer. Show me your glory. To see God's glory will result in, in, in an overwhelming sense of, uh, and, and response of worship and praise and humility and, and a godly kind of fear because we see all of his purity and holiness among us. To see God's glory will lead us to repentance of sin. If you don't want to repent, don't pray to see God's glory. I pray that you'll pray to see God's glory so it'll lead you to repent of sin. To see God's glory is to see the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ and give our lives in willing submission and faith to Him. To see God's glory is to have your entire life dramatically changed. And friend, what if that was not true just for our own lives but for the life of our church? What if as a body of believers, a representative of the bride of Christ that meets in this place, God were to show us his glory in a way that we could not refute, we could not deny, and that would change us forever? You have the boldness to pray that way this morning? I ask you to. I ask you to. Let's let's pray together. As we pray in this last session, our uh, Pastor Danny and the uh, leaders are going to come to the platform that we might uh, respond uh, in worship even as we do in prayer. Let's, let's pray and ask God to be glorified in us.
the gift of your grace that we receive through faith in Jesus so that you will be glorified, so that the name of Christ would be exalted and magnified above every other name. You have saved us so that we would become a living temple for your Holy Spirit. You saved us to receive glory and praise from us. And having known your salvation, God, it's our heart's delight to praise you for it, to give you thanks for doing what no person could conceive of, for doing what no person could do for us. And not only have you saved us, but you've, you've brought us together uh, under the, the name and common faith in Jesus, your son, to be his body, his bride, to, to have this mysterious but eternal union with our Savior in a way that, that results in a, a, an ongoing, a, a cascading and multiplying reverberation of the good news that God saves sinners in Christ Jesus around the world. Father, we want you to receive all glory in heaven and on earth. And we pray that you would receive glory in us. Not in what we do only, but most especially in who we are. Sinners saved by grace through faith in Jesus. God, you're magnificent for doing this. It's our delight to give you praise today, God. It's our delight to magnify your name. Jesus, it's our delight to say, Holy Spirit, there is no other spirit like you, divine and perfect in every way, the spirit of Christ dwelling in us and to to just marvel at these gospel realities. God, we want to be a church that is overflowing with your glory. And so we pray that you would Show your glory to us. Demonstrate it among us. That's a scary thing to ask God because of what it will require from us in response. Repentance, faith, humility, dependence upon you. But all these things that your glory and and, and a perception of your glory brings out in us are things that we need and that we need from you. So show us your glory that we might be the church as you have designed and desire. Jesus, may you receive all praise above every other name from the saints that make up First Baptist West Albuquerque. Let us extol no other. Let us honor no other. Let us worship and praise no other name but the name of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, in our endeavor to grow in godliness, in our endeavor to make disciples of Jesus Christ, so we pray that you would guard our hearts with the gospel, guard our minds. Holy Spirit, guard our tongues and the things that we say so that all that we think and desire and speak would only be that which results in praise to God and the magnification of the name of Jesus. It's in his name that we ask God to glorify yourself in your church. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want for us to...